If you've ever built your own magic system, you'll know it's a lot of fun. But what makes for a great magic system that keeps people talking for ages, versus a real stinker that keeps people talking for ages? As a random but confident voice on the internet, I am an expert at everything as far as you know, so here are my top 5 picks for making your magic system great. Tip 1. Have limitations and stick to them. In the words of the famous author and world builder Captain Jack Sparrow, the only rules that really matter are these, what a magic can do, and what a magic can't do. And I'm pretty sure he said that. Regardless, introducing limitations is the fastest way to make your magic unique, flavorful, and interesting. A lot of authors skip this step. <laughs> Rolling! They just make their magic do whatever they want whenever the story needs it. Those stories can still be great, don't get me wrong. Lord of the Rings does this wonderfully. But having no limitations is a huge missed opportunity. Creativity thrives under constraint, and it doesn't take much magic to change the course of history. Just a random example off the top of my head, let's say you've got people who can fly, but you decide arbitrarily that their magic can only propel them directly up. Also for simplicity, this is the only magic there is. How would that one thing change the world? Well, what would you do if you had that power? For me, hang gliding immediately comes to mind. I can imagine sky surfers who use wind and special kite-like outfits to travel long distances. Combat between sky surfers would be badass swooping and diving and stuff. Especially for ancient people, sky surfing would revolutionize hunting, exploration, communication, trade, warfare. The wind and the weather would be incredibly important to these people. Storms would be a Big deal, as they effectively shut down long-distance communication. That might well tie into their religion. I could go on. Feel free to steal any of that, by the way. The point is that it all came from a constraint. Limitations are your friend. Tip 2. Heavily limit time magic and resurrection. When you're deciding your magic's limits, think very carefully about any magic that can undo major plot points. Time travel and bringing back the dead are the two big ones, but anything that can make it like it never happened needs care. The danger is that if these magics are too easy to use, then you can easily get to a place where nothing matters. A good story needs victories to matter, for the threat of defeat to mean something, and these magics can make it all meaningless. Anything bad that happens can be fixed, but also anything good that happens can be lost, and the audience quickly learns not to become too emotionally invested in anything. The Time Turners in Harry Potter are a great example of this. They made for a great plot resolution in Book 3, but then, when Rowling wanted to move on to other stories, they were an issue. Most problems can be addressed with time travel, and I'm pretty sure people noticed and kept asking her, why don't they solve that with the Time Turners? How come they don't get some Time Turners to secretly rescue so-and-so? How come the bad guys aren't using Time Turners? Worse, all the outcomes of all the previous stories that she ever told were in danger of being undone by teams of stealthy time travelers. So Rowling retroactively tried to fix it. In the fifth book, she had all the time turners destroyed. Actually, she got them stuck in an infinite time loop, which honestly is a pretty clever way to get rid of them. That of course wasn't nearly enough to satisfy everyone, so much later she published new rules for the time turners on the internet, explaining that they're very dangerous and anyway they can't go more than five hours back in time. But even that didn't really fix the problem, and I'll explain why next. The moral is, don't do what she did. If you have powerful plot-altering magic, make sure it's clear up front when it can and cannot be used, and why the other parts of your story still matter. Tip 3. Don't underestimate what people will pay. The reason the time-turner problem wasn't really solved was because the limits introduced could be overcome, which means they were really costs, not limits. Oh, the only known time-turners in Britain are gone? Well, somebody made them which means it's possible to make more, it's just a matter of money and expertise really. Oh, they only go back five hours? Well, first of all, that's plenty enough time to be a huge freaking deal. Anyone with the power to get their hands on one would be a fool not to. But yeah, going back further would clearly be better, and those five-hour ones are strong evidence that going back further is probably possible. It's just a matter of research and motivation, really. And here's the thing, just the hope that it might be possible would be enough to motivate people. You have to understand, the reason time travel stories are so compelling is because people everywhere deeply, fervently, desperately wish they could go back and fix things, wish they could save the people they love, 
there are at least millions, perhaps billions of people in the world who would trade anything, do anything for that power. If it were known to be possible, it doesn't matter what the costs are. It doesn't matter what the laws are. There is no government on earth capable of holding back that tide. Wars would be fought over this. If necessary, entire new industries would arise to satisfy the magical costs. People would find a way and woe betide anything that stands in their path. So keep that in mind as you're deciding what the costs of your magic are. If the promises offered by magic are good enough, the costs may well shape how the world works. Just don't underestimate the lengths people will go to fulfill them. Tip 4. Think about the economy and warfare. Earlier I mentioned just the ability to levitate would dramatically impact trade and war. You should assume every magic you come up with will have at least that much impact on the economy and warfare of your world. If your setting is pre-industrial revolution, then any magic that can help make or transport food will be a huge freaking deal. If you have earth or water magic, you might just call it farming magic because 90% of the time, that's what it would be used for. If you can just make food out of nothing, that's an even bigger deal. In olden times, wars were usually about taking land, and land was valuable because it made food. In modern times, food matters less, but wars are still fought over resources, and every new war is fought differently from the last one. The rules of war change every time because the technology changes every time. And whichever side does a better job of understanding that usually wins. Magic, similarly, would change the rules of war. It may take some creativity to see how, but war has a way of making people think very creatively. Also keep in mind that war doesn't have to be about troops marching on a battlefield. War is just getting your enemies to do whatever you want, by whatever means you can. Let's consider another example. Say long distance teleportation magic is widely available. And again, for simplicity, that's the only magic. Historically, cities were limited in size by the amount of food that could be farmed within easy traveling distance. Our whole world is within easy traveling distance, so perhaps there is only one massive super city. Rich people who can afford to commute by teleportation live in suburbs scattered in beautiful locations across the world, atop mountains and forests on islands. The poor live either in the super city or on the land they farm. Controlling territory is impossible, so there are no geographical countries. Instead, there are ideological factions and gangs. Most people hide what factions they belong to and frequently move around to make tracking them difficult. Division is reinforced by religion. Some people are true believers, others just work for whoever pays the best. War is constant, but it's low key and mostly about assassinating the opposition leaders. Teleportation makes that easy if only you can find out where they are physically located. So naturally, that's a closely guarded secret at all times. The real fighting is all about information, espionage, and infiltration. Gathering true believers physically together for a religious service is an extremely dangerous thing to do. So it happens rarely and always in secret, but that just makes it all the more fulfilling. Seeing your leaders in person is considered an incredible honor. It's so rare that there are rumors some of the leaders aren't even alive anymore, or perhaps they never were. Okay, I might have got a little carried away there, but hopefully you get the idea. Magic can, and probably should, have a profound effect on how wars and economics work. The more you think about it, the more interesting things can get. Tip 5. Mix hard and soft magic. There's a lot of discussion about the merits of hard versus soft magic. In short, if there are no rules, or the audience doesn't know the rules, that's soft magic. Soft magic is great for creating atmosphere, like a fear of the unknown or a feeling of fantasy adventure. Soft magic is the most magical kind of magic because any magic that gets too well defined can start to feel more like technology. The downside of soft magic is that it cannot be used to save the day. See, if the magic with no rules fixes everything, it does so untethered to any decisions anyone made. And that feels like deus ex machina. It's unsatisfying because nothing anyone did mattered. It feels like lazy writing, and people hate it. If your protagonists are using magic to resolve things, it's got to be hard magic. Hard magic is just a piece of magic that has rules the audience understands. Specifically, they got to know what its requirements are. The secret nobody talks about is that you can change soft magic into hard magic and then back again in one or two lines. At the end of the original Star Wars movie, Obi-Wan says, Use the Force, Luke. Let go, Luke. Luke. Trust me. Good enough. 
Often the force is a very soft magic, very vague and undefined. But in this instance, it becomes hard magic because the audience knows what it can do and what it requires. It's not acting mysteriously, it's got rules. And it saves the day, and it's a very satisfying ending because it was clearly dependent upon the hero's decisions. But the rules only applied for this one thing, so it's immediately back to being soft magic. And that's the thing about soft and hard magic. It's often presented as a binary choice or a spectrum, but honestly, good stories always do both. Just explain the rules whenever the magic is resolving plot, and let the rest be mystical and mysterious. That's it. That's the whole secret. Hopefully you found that helpful. If so, I've got more world building advice and some stories you'll probably enjoy. And until next time, toodles.